Kresge Arts in Detroit and WDET welcomes you to our virtual artist salon series featuring the 2021 Kresge Artist Fellows and Gilda Awardees. This series includes never before seen video presentations by awarded Metro Detroit artists and writers. This program is a collaboration with Kresge Arts in Detroit and WDET. It is a part of Kresge Arts in Detroit's mission to advance and showcase the work of Kresge Artist Fellows and Gilda Awardees. It provides a space for growth, discovery, and furthers connection between Kresge artists and the wider arts community. I am Ebony Jones, program producer for Kresge Arts in Detroit. My pronouns are she and her. And though we are centering today's conversations around the artists, we do invite you to introduce yourself by dropping your name, pronouns, and a bit about yourself into the chat. Closed captioning will be capturing responses in real time during this artist salon. Today's artist salon will feature artists Anne Eskridge, Jenny DeLisle, and Rochelle Merritt. I want to thank Kresge Arts and Detroit staff for their support of this program and to acknowledge Andrea Yilopoti, who is the founder of Wild Projects and a huge component to the production of this event. Andrea will be providing tech support today. So if you come across any tech issues, please chat with her directly. She is also recording this session to be shared on Kresge Arts in Detroit in the very near future. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for this afternoon, Orlando P. Bailey. He is an Emmy Award-winning journalist with Bridge Detroit and a former deputy director for Eastside Community Network in Detroit. He is the co-host of the Authentically Detroit podcast and is the host at Detroit's Urban Consulate. Welcome and thank you so much, Orlando. Thank you for uh, the invitation, Ebony, and uh, to all of our guests and to our featured artists. Um, I say to you all, uh, good afternoon. It is indeed an honor and privilege to serve as your moderator uh, this afternoon. Um, I want to give a special shout out to my colleague over at WDET, Ryan Patrick Cooper, who is the old pro in this. I'm sort of stepping into new territory, but I am so excited, so very excited to be here and to share uh, this amazing space with all of you. I'll now quickly explain uh, the format of the Artist Salon and we'll dive right into Anne's presentation. So as stated, uh, this series is designed to showcase and advance our 2021 Kresge Artist Fellows and Gilda Awardees creative practices. We will begin uh, with a 10 minute presentation to take a closer look into the work of the artists. If you are experiencing, once again, if you're experiencing issues with your Zoom connection and video isn't coming through for you, Andrea will drop a link in the chat where you can view the video on your own, okay? Um, the same, same time uh, that the video is playing via Zoom. Uh, we will readmit you into the meeting if you need to drop off to personally view uh, the presentation. Uh, I'm still seeing people introduce themselves in the chat. Hey, y'all, it's good to see y'all. I love it, I love it. My mom said, when you come into a room, make sure you speak. So uh, as people are joining us, go ahead and make sure you speak and make yourself known in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions that come to mind while you're watching the presentation, uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat uh, right away. Uh, and next, we'll engage uh, in a 10 minute um, uh, moderated Q&A where you'll be able to exchange ideas and perspectives among one another. So this is only going to work if you all participate. So we're asking for your participation afterwards. We'll repeat, we will repeat the same process over for Jenny and Rochelle. So before we get started, let me ask this right now. Does anybody have any questions? Let me look at the chat. Oh, I see Josh Bales, who's so, so excited to be the husband of Jenny. Uh, Andrew, hey, good to see you, Andrew. Thank you for watching the consulate. Um, all right, any questions? No questions? All right. Since there are no questions, barring uh, any questions, I am going to uh, hand it off to our first presenting artist, Anne Eskridge, to introduce herself and get us going. Anne? Hi. How are you? How's everybody? Amazing. Um, so my name is Ann Eskridge. I'm a 2021 uh, Kresge Fellow in Playwriting. 
And um, what else do you need to know about me? I've been a longtime educator um, as well as a writer through about 15 different jobs. Um, I've always written regardless of what those jobs were. So um, the video that you're going to see is my own creation. And I want to say thank you and I apologize to all the videographers and all the video editors that I've ever worked with because I decided that I was going to do it myself and it was the most frustrating and wow. it's probably not the best, but I just needed to do it on my own and I'm just lucky that I got through with it. Um, so the video is answers two questions or states two questions, two answers. One is that um, sometimes the story picks you as opposed to you picking the story. And you seem, and I, and because of that, you have a responsibility to make sure that you can do your very best. The other is an answer to questions that I always get, which is, um, so now that you've written a screenplay or play or a, a, a book, so when does it get published? When does it get produced? When does it get, when, when do we see it? And it's, to me, it's been a long process. It's been an interesting process, but sometimes the stuff does not happen right away. So this particular video sort of gives you an idea of what that's like. All right, we can't wait to see it. Uh, without further ado, let's let's roll video and. The reason why we're here in this space is because there's more room to tell you about my journey that one story took me on. I'm going to tell you how a story found me and won't let me go. I'm a Southside Chicago girl, but I went to school at University of Oklahoma in journalism, and while I was there, I heard about these all-black towns. Years later, I wanted to find out more about these towns. I wanted to write about them, but there really wasn't a lot of information except some books. So I decided that I was going to go back to Oklahoma and see what I could find. My girlfriend, Lisa, went with me. She was born and raised in Shakota, Oklahoma, and went to school at University of Oklahoma. So we arrived in Norman, Oklahoma, but then we drove to Okmulgee, which is the seat of the Creek Indian Nation, where I wanted to do research. Well, we did the research, we drove back to Norman, and then I realized I left my purse. So the next day we had to drive all the way back to Okmulgee, which was a two-hour drive, and on our way, I saw a sign that said Grace in Oklahoma, all black town. So we headed in that direction and we got lost. But then we found the junction where there was a gas station slash barbecue place slash laundromat. And there we met a man who said he could take us to Uncle Felix, who was the oldest person in Grayson. And maybe Uncle Felix would have something to say. And he did. I retrieved my purse, came back to Detroit, began writing, and wrote a three-part miniseries, which a production company wanted to option. But I knew that if I did that, if I gave them the option, then I would probably lose the rights to my characters as well as the story. So I decided to use the miniseries in order to write a three-part book. And you know something? The book still isn't finished. I wanted to get a grant so that I could go back to Oklahoma to finish the book, but I didn't get one. So years later, I wrote another grant for a documentary. This time, I got it. Unfortunately, I had no visuals for the documentary. I had an interview that I had done with Marcellus Williams because he grew up in the all black town of Tallahassee. These two books of poems were written by Naomi Long Magic. Her great aunt had worked in Oklahoma. She had been a teacher in Guthrie. So I went to Naomi, who was the poet laureate of Detroit. 
and asked her if she had any artifacts or any stories about the all-black town. She said she didn't, but what she did have was a videotape. And on that videotape was 16 millimeter footage of black town that I know no one had ever seen. I had my documentary. So Rich Whiskey, the cameraman, and I went on a whirlwind tour of some of the black towns. We went to Redburg, Summit, Vernon, Grayson, Langston, Bowling. Echoes Across the Prairie became a 15 minute documentary and won an award. The original footage is now at the Smithsonian. I tried to get money for a longer piece, but that didn't happen, so I put the documentary aside. So, now I had a documentary, I had most of the book written, I had a mini-series, and all three of them were Echoes Across the Prairie. That was their title. But I didn't know what to do with it. And then one day, I sat down and I was watching, I think it was with Tony, and it had a revival of Oklahoma, the musical. And I was looking at this and thinking to myself, this is not the Oklahoma that I know. So, I decided to write my own musical about the Oklahoma and the All Black Towns. And what is it called? Well, it first was called the nicest little Negro town west of the Mississippi, but then my dramaturg told me that that was more like a title of a song. So I named it Echoes Across the Prairie, and I'm working on it now. Ah, just round of applause. So for someone uh, who's not a professional videographer, I would say good job. Well, thank you. You're being very <laughs> kind. It was easy to follow learn. along. <laughs> I had to learn from the ground up. So um, I'm pleased that I at least got it done. So yeah, <laughs> it looked great and it, it and uh, it told a magnificent story. Uh, I want to remind everyone that if you have questions for Anne to just go ahead and drop them in the chat, we'll try to read them aloud. But uh, I guess my first question for you, I'll, I'll jump us off is you went to college in Oklahoma um, and you had heard about uh, these all black towns. But my, 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 my question is how and where did the curiosity come from to do such a deep exploration um, into what you had heard about? Um, and uh, how, how does one develop and act on the things that we are curious about. You just start. Um, it was because some of my friends were from Oklahoma. I met, you know, and I, long, lifelong friends. And I just thought it was amazing that there was this miles and miles of prairie and that it had sheltered many blacks. So, you know, you put it aside and then years later you go, you know, that's a damn good story. Mm -hmm. And I don't see anybody writing it or I don't see anybody talking about it. So maybe I can do research. And this was before the internet. So the only books, you know, the only thing that I could get was books. And then I, you know, you have to go back. And it just so happened that because I lost my, not lost my purse, but left my purse, I was able to go back to the place, Grayson. And then this guy said, hey, I'll take you to the oldest guy in Grayson. And believe me, Grayson is like 10 people. Uh, and uh, he can tell you some information. Like he said, for instance, that, uh, Grayson was not called Grayson before. Grayson was the post office, the people who owned the post office. It was the city is called, the town is called Wildcat and it was named by for an Indian, right? And it had been an Indian town. And so, um, you know, so those kinds of things uh, made it really interesting. And the fact that mysteriously and serendipitous, serendipitously, I was able to find this footage 
had I not gone back to, to Oklahoma and talked to these people and told and asked them, did they have any pictures? Did they have any movies? Did they have anything to document? And they said no. So when I saw the footage and I went, whoa, whoa, nobody's seen this footage. Nobody's seen it at all. So that was that was the documentary and that spurred me on. Speaking of serendipity, how serendipitous was it for you to forget your purse and stumble upon? Uh, when those kinds of things, and it's not, it's happened more than once. When that happens, you know that somebody's guiding you. Remember yeah. I said that, you know, sometimes the story picks you. Yeah. Um, the other thing that happened is uh, Rich and I came back and we had to do a little video about a project that we were working on called the sanctuary which was uh, a grief and bereavement program so we were sitting down um with the one of the people and i said rachel you know i worked with you for six months i don't even know your last name and she said oh it's rachel grayson and the back of my <laughs> Rachel. And she was one of the descendants. Oh of, my gosh! Yeah, she was one of the descendants of the people, the po the people who owned the post office at, at in Grayson, Oklahoma. The story picks you. Uh, what an amazing personification of that! I want I want to ask you what it felt like to see footage, recordings of black folks in a time where we don't always get to see them uh, in, in a specified time, especially not depicted uh, as human as we are, right? And what we saw even in, in your short were black folks being human and uh, dressed up and be, being, you know, citizens. And I think, you know, a tenet of colonialism and white supremacy is theft, right? right. Uh, but you uncovered uh, this footage. Um, what, what, what was going through your mind? What did you feel? Take me back to the moment when you first saw it. What did you feel when you saw it? So, so first of all, I knew that whoever did the filming of this, because we're talking about like 1926. Yeah. So you have these big, huge cameras, film cameras, right? So you, it's not it's not easy to carry those around. But I knew that whoever this was, and we didn't know it at the time who it was, but it, his name is S.S. Jones, and he was Reverend S.S. Jones, right? Uh, I knew that he was doing it deliberately. I knew that he was trying to make a record. And so it was uh, dependent upon me to make sure that somebody saw this, right? So um, I was I was amazed. Not only that, there's a piece where you have this guy standing there, and the sign says, "Because as this Jones probably told him to do it, uh, my first oil well." Hmm. And then the next thing is my second oil well. I'm like, this is fantastic. So the footage resides at the Smithsonian, um, and uh, I was very proud of the fact that. Uh, this historical footage was given to me to to help Guy. Yeah, I mean, when I when I first looked at the video and I saw the video um, a, a while ago, um, I I was I was I was emotional, and I, I have to tell you because I think we only see uh, in this deliberate one depiction of Black folks on record. Um, and it, it's never our full humanity, it's never our citizenship. And to see Black folks in, 19, in the 1920s dressed up, uh, going about their day uh, in their community, it was, it, it, was, it was very moving. I wanna ask you about, I wanna ask you about ownership uh, because you talked about um, the, the, the three parts book that you wrote and the, the, the story that you wrote in it. You wanted to hold on to it and you not wanting to lose the rights to your characters. Why is ownership for the Black artist so important? Well, first of all, because most of the ownership has been borrowed and stolen. But the other, there's a dynamic in screenwriting, and that is your product is your script. And when you sell your product, right, 
then it's like a can of beans or whatever. That person who bought the, the, that product, it's theirs now. That's why you have so many screenwriter names on the films. Um, but my point, your point was that Black people, particularly Black artists, have not had the opportunity to own and to tell their own story because for some reason we may not be recognized, our process may not be recognized. And um, I feel that it's important to be able to say, this is my mind. Yeah. And then I choose to give it to you. I choose to let you borrow it. I choose to, but it's my decision and my choice. I love that. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, was also striking, and then there are some questions in the chat and I'll get to them too, is that uh, you're still not done. You're, you're not done writing it, it's still being no. written. Let me no, ask you a question. No, no, no. Let me ask you this question. I, I have to. Um, are you ever really finished or do you just have to release it? Um, you're, for me, it's I'm finished when I've got a product that I'm proud of. And then the next phase is releasing it and where to release it to. And that's a whole different thing. That's, you know, now you're trying to promote your product so somebody else can either produce it or direct it or something like that. But I'm finished when I think that I've done my very, very best. In this particular instance, I think that I can tell the story a lot quicker and a lot with a lot more um, vibrancy if I did a musical. So now I'm working on musicals. <laughs> and you're a, a, a lyricist. I know you write lyrics yes. too in a musical. Yes. Uh, a question from Ebony Jones in the chat. Question for Anne. You have such a beautiful way of adding humor uh, to the dialogue to keep to deep realities of Black life in America. Um, what is the power of humor in telling these really deep uh, realities? Sometimes joyous, sometimes very painful. Yeah, but also... I think that humor takes the edge off of it. And mm. it's not like we're not serious people. I mean, we're not, not serious. It's just that sometimes you can, what is it? You can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. People mm. tend to be more open if they are able to laugh and particularly at situations which they're familiar with. So I just, first of all, I, I think that I'm, I, I want to put humor in my pieces because that's, to me, that's natural. You know, we have a serious side, we have a humorous side, and I don't see why we can't do both. And we, we as Black folks carry that, you know, very well, even when facing the harshest of the harshness of some of our realities, we can always find some joy, some laughter, uh, because it's, it's what we do, it's who we are. I appreciate that. Uh, Solomon David in the chat says, do you ever think uh, you will or do you want to finish the books, TV miniseries to go along with the musicals so people can enjoy them in the way they like to engage a piece? I have, I don't know <laughs> how much time that would take, but I want to do the musical first and get that. And then because I would do more research for the musical, to see if I can work on the book and see what happens there. As far as the miniseries is concerned, you know, if it's a musical and if it's a book, then somebody can take it and make it into a miniseries. By that time, I'll be sick and tired and whatever <laughs> and need to go on to another project. Uh, I, I want to, before we uh, move on uh, to the next presentation, I want to return to this, this notion of curiosity, Anne. Can you can you take us back to little Anne Eskridge uh, in Chicago? Um, were you always this this curious and a seeker of knowledge? How did how did this start for you? Well, my father was an educator. My mother was a a secretary. Um, I love reading and I love writing. And I remember my mother. I had this idea. Uh, for a children's book 
And so I think it was first or second grade. My mother would be the typist and I would, you know, dictate to her. I'm not exactly sure about the, where the curiosity came from, but I know that when I went to journalism school, there was a whole different world that opened up to me and I could ask questions. And that's the one thing that I learned about reporting and one, one of the skills that I still thank God I have today is that sometimes you can just interview anybody and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And they will, they will answer you. Yeah. So ask the question. You know, if well, they say, no, I don't want to talk, fine. But ask the question. You know, I appreciate that as a journalist myself. Can you, if we got, I still have a little bit of time. Can you talk about the power of the rigorous question? Like asking the right question. Well, I don't know. If, uh, first of all, you have to have a sense of the person. Yeah. Right? Um, and you have to know when you're invading somebody's privacy. And the thing is, is that who are you talking to? Are you talking to a politician or are you talking to an everyday person? You don't use the same interviewing skills, right? Because that everyday person, first of all, is not uh, used to being in front of the camera. So they don't know how to answer. So you're gentle with them, right? Um, but with a politician, I remember one time I made uh, L. Brooks Patterson, man, and he stormed off. Oh, good. We all have. Good. Oh, good. No, he's, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the only one, right? Uh, and but but they they need to you need to ask them the hard questions because they're they're used to the cameras. They're used to avoiding it, and you have to have sympathy and you have to listen yes. because a lot of time, yes, the problem with particularly broadcast that you had so much time to interview something and somebody else was calling you to do another story. So uh, you have to listen. And that, that'll that give you a sense of what question to ask next. And Eskridge, thank you for sharing your gifts with us today. Thank you. I really appreciated this. All right, we'll be right. We'll uh, come back around uh, uh, in the end with all of the artists, but I want to transition uh, to uh, Jenny uh, De, De Lajo. I am so excited. Uh, just recently found out that she uh, is married to one of my good friends, Josh, here, here, here in the city of Detroit. Uh, first off, Jenny, tell us how you're doing and tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Oh my gosh, like who knew? I didn't know. Uh Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting. You're a great interviewer. I'm really excited about this because I've watched you on Urban Consulate for a while. So very excited to have this chance. Um, I'm doing great. I'm at work today. I'm coming to this meeting at the um, Educational Resource Lab at Oakland University. And I'm just excited to be here and share. And, and I just enjoyed Anne's presentation so much. Right? Yeah, it was so good. But yours is so good. I. I... <laughs> I, I I saw it already. So, I can't wait for it. so uh, I full disclosure, I, I do want to say initially I had planned to have a recorded conversation with Monica Ong and Samita Shakabarti, but due to some events that happened in my personal life, things had to be rescheduled. And so I ended up having um, Monica send in a recording and Samita and I had a conversation that like Anne tried to take it on myself and, and sort of splice into a conversation. So bear with the audio and it is a PowerPoint. <laughs> not a video. I wasn't brave enough to try a video on my own yet. You're amazing. Yeah. Okay. So with that, Jenny just did a great job of teeing up video. Let's watch it and we'll be back. Hello, I'm Monica Ong and I'm a visual poet currently based in Connecticut. Visual poetics speak to me because of the way I'm able to address cultural silences and hidden histories while also challenging the conventions of reading. As a daughter of Chinese diaspora that came to the American Midwest in the 70s via the Philippines, my experience of language had always been multilingual, fragmented, layered between the legible and illegible, a collage of non-linear fractured literacies. What is unspoken often occupies just as much space as the stories that do find ink. And if they couldn't find words alone, 
than they lingered in my ancestors' faces, their photographs or archives, the island landscapes, their sounds and maps. I'm speaking with Sumita Chakravarti. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. One of the things I've really enjoyed uh, about visual poetry specifically and poetry more broadly is that I think it is more of a source of fun and a source of play when we don't limit its possibilities ahead of time. So for me, initially, and I mean this as in like 10 years ago, I think I had a knee jerk reaction against visual poetry precisely because I was drawing too many of those boundaries, you know, I was thinking George Herbert, um, who, you know, he's got game, but still, <laughs> I think that my sense of what concrete poetics and visual poetics could be was a narrative that was limiting my own ability to experience it. Um, and explore what it could mean to me specifically. So that really changed for me first when I found Diana Coyne Wen's work, um, that her book Ghost of really made me question what kinds of limitations I had placed upon myself, upon the genre, upon what it could mean, and helped me realize that visual poetry is a way by which you can take something that feels ephemeral or marginal or irrelevant or strange or specific and make it more tactile, more embodied. Um, of course, poetry and literature kind of always do that because words are as material as anything else, but visual poetry doesn't let you get away with letting that be an argument or letting that be vague. Whatever strange feeling you have is an object that you have to contend with shaping and other people have to kind of contend with navigating. Up until recently, the public history of visual poetics has largely excluded the work of many experimental BIPOC writers. I owe a lot to scholars and critics who themselves are also contemporary poets, like John Yao, Kathy Park Hong, and Tim Yu, who've been instrumental to not only pointing this out, but also placing the spotlight on the Asian American avant-garde. You know, history is written by those who win. People mm -hmm. say that and and uh, canonize that statement so often in just general discourse. But the parameters of those winning of that winning is wrong and brutal and mean and strange and white supremacist and colonialist and all that terrible, terrible stuff. So what if? And this is what poets and artists are doing. What if you can redefine not only who is writing, what is written, what history means, but also what it could mean to win. What if it could look much more awesome and vibrant? <laughs> I think one of the things that drew me to visual poetry first was my background in storytelling. I come from a family of storytellers. It's a big part of our culture. We sit around the table and tell stories. We sit around the living room and tell stories. Where I'm from, we have lots of hurricanes. We have lots of storms that knock out power. And so there's little else to do sometimes, but sit with each other and tell stories. In storytelling, you are the visual element. Your hand gestures, your facial expression, the tone and inflection of your voice. When it comes to poetry, you're approaching the reader in the silent vacuum. The only audio or expressiveness provided comes from the selection of your words and the reader's frame of reference. Visual poetry removes those restrictions by allowing the practitioner to experiment with form, color, shape, language, repetition, and even the concept of logic and sense. I like to work with erasures because I feel like it's storytelling on multiple planes at once. There is a certain arpeggiation that you can accomplish with erasure that I haven't been able to replicate in any other genre or discipline. Currently, my interests are focused on palimpsests which are erasures of poems 
where the text that is erased is turned into the same color as the background and then you write your own text in to merge with the remaining text and the white letters or the light colored letters that you erased are sort of clawing back and taking bits out of the text that you are adding. So you are creating a new piece with an existing piece, but at a price. And I'm just really fascinated with that concept because it does seem that that's the way most of our interactions are structured. We have things that we can and should do, and those things come at a price. And we have the things that we want to do, and those things come at a price as well. And so navigating through anything is a negotiation of cost. And palimpsests really give you the chance to visually express that cost. So you are erasing the words of the original author, but you're not removing them from the conversation entirely. I like to look at visual poetry, erasures and palimpsests especially, as though it's a conversation between the writer of the original piece that's being erased the practitioner of visual poetry who's doing the erasure, the person who's reading the piece, and the page itself. And so the page itself is part of a conversation and how we utilize the page plays into how we are interacting with our readers. And so palimpsests really give you the freedom to play with that. Um. Round of applause to you, Jenny. Uh, really, really enjoyed uh, learning about all of that stuff. You know, one of the, oh, before I get started, because I always have questions and I don't mind asking them, um, I want to remind everyone that if you have uh, questions for Jenny to go ahead um, and drop them into the chat. Uh, but I'm, I'm really excited. You know, one of the things that um, you said to me uh, uh, via email is that, uh, you know, the, the palimpsest, you sort of like in palimpsest in the practice of it um, to revitalization efforts here in the city of Detroit. And I'm often uh, on the ground, as is Josh, right? Uh, and what I am hearing from residents is, you know, this, this cultural anxiety of erasure while the, the practitioner, the developer, what have you, is trying to figure out how to add some new while preserving what was. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the interplay between those forces without passing judgment on any of them. So assuming everyone's on the up and up and everyone just wants what's best for the city. The interplay between long-term residents and what they want and need city structure and fiscally what they need to make programs and projects happen. I mean, we've been working from home for two years now. I've heard a lot of these meetings, you know, it's a shared <laughs> space. So hearing what they want versus what can get done, hearing what the community wants versus what is getting done, hearing what developers promise versus what actually happens, all those things, they're happening here, they're happening across the country. I have a poem called, uh, it's an erasure called Billions in Debt. It's an erasure of an article the New York Times wrote about the bankruptcy here in Detroit. And in it, it says Detroit, one of the lines is the way it reads once it's erased is Detroit is a harbinger of what's to come essentially. Mm. This kind of thing mm. is happening in communities across the country. I'm watching it happen in my hometown now, Hialeah. I saw an article recently, Hialeah is a factory migrant town. The unofficial slogan of my hometown was Agua Fango y Factoria, water, dirt, and factories. That's mm -hmm. just where I'm from. And, and we take pride in that. But now it's East Lea. It's this revitalization and gentrification effort. It's the Brooklyn of Miami. So I see this happening in my hometown, similar to what I have watched over the last 12 years happen in Detroit. And I know it predates that and it'll go on beyond that. But I wanted to find a way to represent that on the page and erasure felt more like duplicating some of the worst elements of it. So I wanted to find a way to bring all those different forces onto the page. And the palimpsest is not technically a poetic form. It's something that is a term used for historical literary documents. But in recreating that in a poetic form, I feel that you can get all that on the page. Yeah. 
Well, well I listen. I, I <laughs> there's so many ways I want to go with this. Um, I want to I want to ask you this question. Uh, you 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 talked about uh, the cost of erasure and um, contending contending with that. Um, when you when you are approaching or you know sitting down to do something new and to write a new piece, how how are you carrying that cost? Yeah, that's part. That's the first part of it for me because it is a cost. I think the idea that you could just come to something and plunder is a very colonialist idea. And listen, I'm yeah. Cuban. Like we know all about colonialism, so I'm trying to avoid that in my practice. And so the first step is research. I'm a I'm a researcher. <laughs> If anyone looks at the Brown study, you can see I like to dig in. So the first thing I like to do is read about the poem, read about the poet, try to find the historical context of what was going on in that piece. And then from there, evaluate what it is I want to construct and why. Sometimes mm. it doesn't make it to the point of writing the poem. Mm. You know? yeah. Sometimes you just, it's not, it's not my poem to write. So it's, it's a lot of calculations before you even get to the point of writing a poem, because I feel like erasure and visual poetry has the potential to carry consequence. And so yeah. you have to carry that responsibility. Yes, <laughs> you should carry that responsibility. Right. And even, you know, I love the point that you're making about knowing when to forsake something. It's like, okay, I have to leave it. This is not for me to write. I want to, I want to ask you about storytelling because um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a storyteller. So it, it intrigues me. I often talk about uh, the urgency of the griot, right? Uh, the passing down the storyteller of West African uh, traditions and customs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of communities of color have, you know, this same tradition. I love the picture you you paint around family gathering and uh, sitting uh, around the table and telling stories. Talk about uh, leveraging and using uh, your body your voice <laughs> as an instrument to illustrate the story that you are trying to tell? That's a great question. So I, I'm gonna go granular and go all the way back to language. One of the mm -hmm. things people who know me in real life know is that I will slip between English and Spanish when I'm really getting into a story. In fact, the storytelling series that uh, we put out here in Detroit was called Relato Detroit. It was specifically about having bilingual storytellers who would switch no, no code switching was basically the code switching at the door. You just speak how you speak and the audience will follow. And it built such great community in those rooms when we had those events. Yeah. So in my storytelling, I talk with my hands. I use my voice. I jump between languages. I've been known to do voices. Like those sorts of things bring texture and dynamic, like a dynamic energy to the content. So like the content exists and, and it should be good on its own, but then this is the spices you bring to the mix to really punch it up. Mm, the spices, <laughs> the tapestry. We do have a couple of, a few questions and comments uh, in the chat and I wanna make sure I get to everyone. Uh, Niha says, uh, it's so thoughtful. I agree. Uh, Bradley is asking this question. Could you expand on your discussion of utilizing the page? It was beautifully stated. I never actively considered it as a partner in the work. Hi, Bradley. Bradley used to be my editor. I'm so happy you're here. Um, so we have in poetry a standard poem I think everyone is familiar with, left a line, sometimes every first line capitalized. Um, and then there are forms that we're familiar with. You might have a sonnet or you might have a, an elegy or you might have couplets, just things that are recognizable on the page. When you start breaking the visual conformity on the page, when you start challenging the reader to look elsewhere, your brain has to function differently. So if you've ever come across a visual poem, if you've ever come across a poem that's scattered across the page, there were a couple of mine that I threw into the presentation with the yellow backgrounds. When your mind has to decide where to look first, mm. when you as the reader have to choose which information you need to prioritize on the page, that page is giving you the platform to do that. And so you have that eight and a half by 11 or whatever the you know, measurements are for the publication to really push the reader to grab their attention, to subvert their attention, to hide or to show. And so we have that whole campus to use. I love how Bradley worded it too, uh, the page as a partner in you know, the artistic process. You, you said something really interesting in your video, and I know we have a couple more questions in the chat. 
um, about uh, the winner being able to, you know, tell the history of a thing and put it on record. Um, and you sort of push back on that. Uh, what's your definition of winning? So that's actually Sumita Chakrabarty who said that, and I agree with her that that is the prevailing narrative, like the winner tells the story. And I think that the pushback from that comes from the arts, the pushback from that comes from policy, the pushback from that comes from conversations that shift that shift that that winning, right? So you can declare yourself the winner, but that's a it's it's not a static state. And I mm -hmm. think that winning comes from building community, comes from harmony. And I don't think that if you're out for self, there's any sort of way to get harmony. There's this game um, that my friends and I play. And in it, there's this concept called harmonic convergence where, where certain things line up on the board game, everybody has to switch seats to the left. So whatever your hand was, however far ahead you were in the game, everybody switches and you take that next person's role. And it kind of forces you to realize we're all playing this game together and winner or loser are relative terms. We're all in this together trying to get through it. And so I try to bring that approach to winning or losing when it comes to the arts, because I just don't think that that zero sum mentality has a, a function. Yeah, I, I love it. And I love the pushback. I mean, it, it really is a tenet of white supremacy that we need to deconstruct <laughs> and unlearn, like for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne asks, is your work spurred by politics? My work is spurred by my lived reality. And my lived reality intersects with a lot of things, including politics. So I try to stay out of politics, but I think it's ignorant to say, or I think it's an, not ignorant. I think it's oversimplified to say it doesn't intersect with politics. Mm. I think anytime you're putting something to a page and stating an, an opinion, it's political. Yeah. Uh, Solomon uh, is giving you kudos. I find the background on how you came to visual poetry and what yours is today. Very intriguing. Um, I, I do too. And also asks, is the fact that your Cuban mate, you view things in a different way? Oh, that's such a loaded question. So I'll, I'll say this. Growing up in Miami, I had a very similar perspective and background to a lot of people who grow up in Miami. Um, now living here, I have a background and perspective that's slightly different, but there are similarities. So Miami is a community, you know, South Florida is shaped by, it's indelibly connected to immigration. Well, so yeah. is much of the Midwest. The Great Migration completely shifted the landscape of the Midwest. And some of that language acquisition that the immigrants who came to the United States and South Florida had to do in learning the, the actual tongue, English, is mirrored in the climate, social, and normative acquisitions that people who went through the Great Migration had to do when they came to the Midwest. It was a different culture, different resources. You don't have the same network you had from back home. So there are some parallels that I like to draw from. Mm. Jenny De Lajo, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank man. you. I can't wait to uh, come wrap, wrap, wrap around with all three of you uh, at the end. But this, uh, great job. Thank you. <laughs> all right, y'all. Wasn't that great? Right? I love it. Okay, so uh, we are going to uh, transition uh, and I'm going to bring in Rochelle. Merit. Uh, hi, Rochelle. I'm going to just ask you to, uh, number one, tell us how you're doing. We want to know how the day is finding you. And so tell us a little bit about yourself before we introduce the video. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm actually really excited for this opportunity. And I'm really excited to get to share space with incredible, incredible artists. So yeah, it's it's a good day. Um, I'm from Jamaica. I am a recent Detroit um, transplant, um, and I'm a I'm a writer. Uh, I I don't know what else you need to know before this video, but yes, that's you know unless you have a question. But no, no question. Welcome home to Detroit. We're happy to be here. <laughs> We're happy to be here. Go ahead and uh, introduce uh, your video that we're getting ready to watch. Yes, yeah, so this video is um, an excerpt of a short story um, that I finished recently um, and that should be published very soon. Um, so hopefully um, after this video, you can, you know, read the full story. But um, 
But yeah, it's called. I know because Big- I I saw the video. You kind of left this on the cliffhanger. So <laughs> now look now, nah, look now. Nah. I mean, it's like 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So, but, um, but yeah, it's called big people business. uh, And it's, it's sort of a, well, you know, I'll, I'll let you watch the video. All right. Let's see it. Yeah. Hello, my name is Rochelle Merritt. And this is an excerpt of my short story big people business. On a Friday evening in early March, Maxine veiled her bathroom mirror in textbook wrapping paper and prepared herself to swallow a bottle of Panadol. Earlier that day, she had picked Nora up from school and slipped into Monarch Pharmacy. This visit, it would seem, no different than any other before. As always, Nora had agreed to wait in the car. Moments later, Maxine had returned and swapping her heels for driving slippers, she set her hands on the wheel and eased into the chaos of Hope Road at rush hour. The paper bag sat upright and menacing in the seat next to her, and Maxine could not help feeling like it's hostage. She kept the radio on but didn't listen, her fingers growing numb, and as she watched them tapping on the wheel, she wondered, without worry, what it could mean that her connection to them was lost. Through the windshield, sun rays lashed her skin, Sitting still, her chest rising and falling, she held her face to the sting. Serve her right, she thought. Her mother had warned her about him. And turning her eyes from the raging sun, she was left only with a punishing light and bitter recollections of her own disillusionment. She noticed some woman standing at a covered bus stop. It could easily be one of them, she figured, sourness cinching her throat. Overhead, on the electronic billboard of a cell phone ad, another three women glistened with pleasure. Or them, she grimaced, tightening her grip on the covered steering wheel. She had no clue what kind of woman her husband preferred. She must have known once, but that time had long since passed. Along her periphery, tall concrete walls sprouted moss and behind them palm trees flapped like tongues. Goodbye, they seemed to say as she inched forward, angling her neck, her stare lingering long trying to make out the rest. Their words garbled at her as though from the depths of the sea, and she squinted into the restless trees, trying to interpret their howls, their frantic movements, curious to her. And she leaned further and further into their cries, perilously, until the blast of a horn lighted her mind. It saved her from a collision with the car ahead. She glanced nervously at Nora through the rear view, then returned to the stretch of road. A faint hue of mountains beckoned along the base of infinite sky. Time slowed, a great weight fastened at its hem. Further on down the road, seasoned taximen raced by, heads and arms jutting from driver's seat windows, recruiting passengers, driving with the urgency of ambulance trucks, bobbing and weaving like corrupt politicians. Adolescents split from school gates like pinif seeds, engulfing sidewalks, knocking shoulders and fists as they made their way to halfway tree, heading towards home. At the stoplight, a boy not much older than her daughter began washing the windshield. At any other time, she might have turned on the wipers or waved a hand to stop him, but this time she reached for her purse 
and handed him a worn thousand dollar bill. The boy's eyes expanded beyond language. Then he scattered like light. She wasn't worried this overgenerous display might raise Nora's suspicion. Her daughter was preoccupied with her new cell phone, and besides, she had been pulling away for months. Unable to meet her mother's eyes, withering at her touch, showing no interest in her mother's affairs whatsoever. For weeks, Nora's face has been pulled into a tight knot, loosening only in moments of sweet surprise. Occasionally, hoping to free her daughter's smile, Maxine sought to orchestrate these moments. That day, she shoved a hand through the window, signaling the young man's peddling boxes of jelly donuts. He wore a rumpled yellow t-shirt and old basketball shorts and the miserable sun bore down on his bare head. He was three cars behind, settling up with another driver and when he saw her, he shot off like a bullet, racing against the stoplight which had changed seconds before. She watched him advance in her side view mirror and when all the cars ahead of her had began to accelerate, she tapped on the gas just enough to allay the travelers behind her. Now the donut man was running in tandem with her moving car, and seconds before the intersection, he sailed a box through the window of the back seat into the child's lap and plucked the bills from her mother, who had witnessed, through the rearview mirror, Nora's smile spreading open like the skies. Now, in the bathroom, Maxine filled a glass of water and set it on the counter with steady hands. She took the pills one by one at first, and then in fistfuls. If there were nerves, she concealed them well, consuming the pills in measured breaths. She might have been eating Tic Tacs. The passing of time and indifferent shrug, it could have been minutes, it could have been years, her mind was bare. It seemed the action, once decided, did not demand her mental participation. In fact, when she placed that pill on her tongue, that one which would be her last, she instinctively tilted the bottle to retrieve the next, but no more fell. And she swallowed the final pill, just as she was noticing it to be the final pill, sensing with frightened awareness that this one was different than the rest. It had landed like a gavel in her stomach. Hurrying to her nightstand, she pulled her Bible to her chest and praised for, prayed for salvation. Surely she would not burn, cradling the word of God to her sternum. But on that matter, she couldn't be certain. And so she flung the Bible open and searched hungrily for the pages which would absolve her. Finding instead crayon markings made when Nora was just a baby. Blues and pinks and yellows scrawled onto the page, overlapping in an infinite loop, the end indiscernible from the beginning. Her face broke into a mad smile, pained, the genesis of a scream that would never come. Had someone asked, she wouldn't have known what to call it. Her emotion stirred and whipped like a severed lifeline. She knew her initial desire had waned, or else had become equally matched with its opposition. She wanted this badly, and on the cusp of having it now despised the wanting of it, a tightrope of uncertainty, and she had never been good at making decisions. She was terrified. Time had already laced its fingers around her neck, and as if to corroborate this, her lungs went flat. She strained for the rim of the bathroom counter. What were you going to do, Maxine? She closed her eyes, not yet knowing how to lift herself above the rising tide. See, what she had really wanted was to be longed for, to receive from Richard even a crumb of what she had given. Over the years, though it hadn't been her intention she had willed herself into the shape of this sustained devotion 
And now, in its absence, in his absence, she would surely collapse. She couldn't point to the moment his validation had become her only evidence of worth, but it had. And she was desperate to have it back. Without it, she was a feathery, insubstantial thing. And the days clapped by. If she was being honest with herself, though she would never say this aloud, she had hoped, shamefully, that this act would redirect his affection, reminding him that it was only the most delicate of threads tethering us to life, and which at any moment could be snapped. But it would mean considerable work excavating this from the recesses of her subconscious. Long after the event, she would still never know its true motivation, only that in the end, she had become conflicted. Now, gathering herself, she stepped a few paces to the left, pressed her back against the stippled bathroom wall and slid to the floor remaining calm enough to yell for Nora, who, when she heard her mother's voice, was tempted to increase the volume on her CD player. Thank you. Uh, round of applause. <laughs> round of applause for Rochelle. Listen, um, what uh, an amazing thread of prose that you just dropped on us. I mean, I, I got to tell you that uh, I was from, from the start and it's, it's how you read it too. Um, from the very first line, you know, um, I was hooked. I was hooked, big people business. Um, how did you arrive to that title and how did you know that you wanted to tell the story of Maxine. Where did Maxine come from? Okay, so the title, so further in the story, um, so the story at that moment shifts to the perspective of Celine or of Nora, sorry. Um, I've been through many names of Nora. <laughs> um, shifts to the perspective of Nora, the, the daughter. And so um, in, in her, uh, section she calls it big people business and um mm. that's that's where the title of the story comes from um because she's sort of wrestling with um we, we end up we end up you know discovering that Nora m knows more than her mother thinks and um she's kind of wrestling with with what to do with the information that she has um and yes, so big people business because she's only 13. So, uh, and your second question, where did Maxine come from? Yeah. So the first line came to me first, honestly. Um, I just, it just, it just came and I just had to keep, you know, writing from there. But um, I think honestly, it was, I was trying to think, you know, what, what would get someone to this point? Um, you know, I, I, I've just like, I think in, in my own life, I've definitely witnessed um, infidelity and sort of just the, the havoc that it wreaks, um, you, know, you know, within families and within households. And so I definitely wanted to, to tackle this um, in a way that felt, in a way that felt, um, I, I wanted to do it with care, you know, I, I really- Exactly I really, how I was gonna describe it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, really, I really wanted to make sure that, um, you know, you, you have like deep empathy for, for the characters. So, yeah. So you drew from your own experience in life to create Maxine. I don't, I don't want, I want to say that. I didn't say all that. Uh, I'm yeah. asking, I'm asking the question. <laughs> um, I, 
I drew from, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of things I, I have, you know, there's just a, a small thing sometimes that happens or that, and it sort of like creates a whole world in your mind. And I think this is, this is, this, this story is that example of, of sort of, you know, being in the world, experiencing something and then thinking, well, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, and then just taking it down that, in that direction, you know? Yeah. Um, you, you, you write, and you display so so beautifully Maxine's humanity and complexities uh, within this, this moment um, leading up to um, a suicide attempt. Um, you talked about wallpapering the bathroom mirror. You talked about um, essentially the world sort of sending her messages through palm trees and through uh, the walls as if they were uh, saying goodbye. Um, why was it important to give us this picture um, as she was, as it was going to culminate with her being in, in the bathroom at, in the end? Yeah, it was important to me to show what led her to this, to this moment, you know, that it wasn't sort of like, um, a frivolous decision that she had made and everything that she would be leaving behind and that she had considered those things um, and, and that she had decided ultimately, well, she thought she had decided um, what her decision was or you know, what she would do. But um, the, the, the paper on the mirror, you know, all of that is um, sort of a cultural thing. Um, there's like, sort of this belief, um, if you, you know, when someone has died, you, you cover, you cover the mirrors um, so that their, um, their spirit can kind of go free, that they don't get trapped where they are. Um, and so that's, that's sort of like me, um, you know, me kind of talking to that aspect of my culture. And, um, and then, you know, everything that she's seeing along the way, I think, that that sort of um, feels like it's encouraging her. Um, I think I think a lot of times when you when you've sort of made a decision, you feel that everything around you is confirming and corroborating that decision, um, whether or not it is. And and so I, I wanted to I wanted to show that in this way. Uh, that's such a part of the human experience. That's so true. Um, you talked about uh, Maxine getting to the point where she wants she she wanted the decision that she made uh, to take her life as much as she didn't want it. Ah, oh, it was it, <laughs> it was it was such it was such um, a powerful moment. But she realized it after that last pill. Can you say more? She realized that once she opened the Bible and saw um, just those markings by Celine or by Nora, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, by Nora. Um, I think, you know, I, I, she opened the Bible for some kind of validation, right? Um, and I think, you know, it's it sort of in line with what she was seeing, um, as she was driving, what she saw with the palm trees and everything. So just as she had paused because, because she, she wanted to pause, you know? And so when she opened, when she opened the Bible and she was looking for, for something to tell her, um, this was, this was the right choice or something to, to tell her what the choice was, what the choice should be. She saw those markings and she was like, no, it, it can't, it, my 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 reading of it, and it's weird to say because I wrote it obviously, but I think when when you're an artist, sometimes you know things just sort of flow from you. You know, you don't you don't always you don't get get to decide, um, which might sound a little <laughs> a little crazy, but you don't get to decide sometimes. You just have to go. You have to go with it. And so, um, yeah, in that moment when she opened Bible and she saw those markings, she 
she was she decided okay I need more time I need to figure this thing out mm, I need more time you write Nora uh so beautifully I mean you you describe you know a typical teenager who don't really want to be bothered uh, with her parents, right? Who sort of, you know, gone into herself, even the cliffhanger you left us on, because I need to know what happened about when her mom called her, it was like, do I turn up my CD player or do I go, through, you know, like what she wants. But uh, this relationship that you described between Nora and Maxine and Maxine's desire to even one last time see Nora smile and this, this scene with the donut man. <laughs> um I you know what I I really wanted to have a scene like that because that was such um that was a part of my childhood you know going yeah. like every single day um that was a big deal actually so I I was like you know how do I how do I just I mean you know when I'm when I'm writing stories um these things always the these small moments are always a part of my stories because it's just a part of Jamaican life, Jamaican experience. Um, so I yeah. love it. And I was looking for Rich because I'm ready to slap Rich. Like Rich, <laughs> you know, like I'm I'm mad at Rich. I mean, you said that all she wanted was to be longed for. She just wanted a crumb of what she had given. I mean, just beautiful prose. I gotta get to some of the questions in the chat, but when I find Richard, I got something for him. <laughs> Um, this question is from Solomon. What was the thing, people, or situation that attracted you to the, to the Detroit area? How does the Tri-County area impact your art today? Oh gosh, well, I, you know, I first, I want to say that um, I actually moved here because my husband um, is from this area. And so when, when we, um, once, once I realized I was pregnant, we wanted to be around, we lived in Dallas at first. And so we wanted to be around family. So that's actually why we moved here um, initially. And then I think, you know, and being a part of the Detroit community has been, you know, an incredible experience because it's such a very vibrant and booming. Um, I, I, you know, I think like, um, the first thing I did I, when I came, I think was I started, I joined a, a writing class and then that sort of led me to the room project. And there I met like so many people. And then, you know, I, the pe people there, you know, told me about Kresge and they were like, you have to apply. And, you know, I don't know. I think it's just, it's just been like an incredible experience because Detroit has been so warm and, so welcoming. I'm so happy to hear um, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Solomon, Solomon has another question. Um, your writing of the character feels very internal. I felt like I was in the car scene. Who are some of the creators, writers, musicians, etc., who inspire you? Uh, Solomon also says, I really like how uh, you allow your culture covering mirrors to not trap the soul to be a part of your literature. Thank you. Uh, who am I? Okay, so Michelle Cliff, she's a Jamaican writer. Um, she's, yeah, definitely one of my, you know, one of the people who inspire me. Um, she unfortunately passed away, um, I think in 2016, but um, wish I could have met her. Um, James Baldwin. Of course. Uh, 100%. You know, I, yeah, I, 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 I find his work to be just it, it's sort of it's sort of something to kind of like you know you hope that you're like one day I too will be able to um to speak to my community and to reflect the people the people who I love and who and who suffer in the same way that um that James mm. Baldwin is able to do that um mm. uh, let's see Zadie Smith Edith Wharton, mm -hmm. uh, so many people, Kai Miller, uh, Tony we Morrison. Can just out. We can, Morrison. I, never, I could just keep going. I just, all oh. the books behind me in my, that was, that was shot in my, in my office 
So all, all those books there. All of those folks. All of those. <laughs> um, uh, I, I know we have to bring everybody back, uh, but there, there was um, a line that, that stood out for me. You said this about Richard. Um, his validation became her only evidence of worth. And it just, it, it got me thinking um, of how, how people, especially women, um, can get to that kind of place. Ah, I mean, it, and, and as you see, you, you've been able to draw from instances that you've seen um, in real life, and I've seen that, and I, and I think I see it all too often. And for you to, to put words to it, I think that um, a lot of women, especially Black women who read this, are going to feel so seen, seen, her validated. Uh, question from Jenny. Um, uh, if your writing was in conversation with some visual artist, who might they be? That that is tough because I'm like, I'm not. I don't know, Jenny. I, you know, I was looking at all the all the images um, in Jenny's presentation. They're all so incredible. But I just, I feel like I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't know. Um, or musicians. She said no. visual artists, oh. musicians. She just added. I'm sorry. Musicians. <laughs> oh. Um, hmm. Should I talk about what I'm? Um, so there's a musician called Lila Aiki. If you L I L A I K E. Um, she's incredible. And I, yeah, I, you know, she's kind of, I have like a, I don't have a writing playlist because I like to write in silence, but you know, playlist to kind of get me in the mood to write. Um, she's definitely, she's definitely on that. Um, J. Cole also. Really? He's my favorite. He's yeah. like, like, I was just telling my cousin the other day, like he's my, he's number one. <laughs> yeah. He is. He is. Yeah, J. Cole. Um, I don't know, of course I'm, this is, if I had like, if I knew beforehand, I would like list out, you know, 75 people, but I, yeah, I, this is what it's coming up top of my head right now. Um, but yeah, I can, maybe I'll put some in the chat later. Yeah, think of them. Thank you so much, Rochelle. I want to bring sure. back uh, Anne and uh, Jenny. Uh, we, get, we have just a couple of final questions for everybody for the entire, hey y'all, there they are. Hey everybody. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. Um, the question um, for the artists, and this is, from, this is from Ebony, and this is for all of you as writers, uh, what do you feel your superpower is? And let's start with you. Oh, my man. Um, in life or in writing or what? Um, as writers, what do you feel your superpower is? Ebony, do you want to expand on your question? No. Okay. So <laughs> I think, anyway. in any way. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of writing, I think being able to take a piece, understand what the bones are of that piece, and then be able to transmute it into something else. So if it was a piece of fiction, you know, um, how can I make it into a uh, uh, um, a play, how can I make it into a screenplay? How can I make it more accessible? So I think that's one of my strong points. Mm, one of your superpowers. Uh, Jenny, what about you? I think probably my strongest suit is connecting things, whether it's people who I think need to know each other or resources or ideas or research concepts to ideas. I think where I thrive is in finding those, connecting those dots. Mm. Rochelle. I think mine is, I, th I think the, re the, the reason why um, my characters sometimes come off as being so real is because I, I think one of my superpowers is being able to, um, 
sort of sit in someone else's situation, sit in someone's place and kind of look around and see how they might see things. Um, and and I, I think that also comes from, you know, a lot of obser observation um, and talking to people. And, but I think, um, but yeah, I, I think just being able to um, empathize and to sort of bring that to the page. Yeah. Uh, my question uh, is, around, is around narrative um, and record. Um, and in your piece, you sort of talked about seeing uh, this Tony Award winning musical and it's like, well, that's not the Oklahoma that you've researched and known. And um, Jenny, you talk about, you know, this, you know, holding space for both what is there, uh, the process of uh, creating or adding to what is there and carrying that tension. Um, and uh, you, Rochelle, talk about, you know, being able to really, really deeply feel and empathize with being in someone else's shoes. I think um, the kinds of stories that you all are telling are traditionally locked out of the mainstream narrative about our various communities. And what you all are adding to, you're adding a tapestry of nuance, complexity, and humanity to communities that are not always viewed in that way. Is that intentional and why? Uh, Jenny, I see you nodding, I'll start with you. So I can't speak for anyone else, but on my end, absolutely. And why, the, the question should be, why wouldn't anyone? I think, mm -hmm. why wouldn't anyone have that intent with their writing to uplift and affirm and tell the truth about the communities to which we belong or to which we are privy or to which we're in we love? That's our responsibility if we are given the trust of a viewership. Uh, Professor Eckrich. Oh, um, I just feel that we, as a people, as a Black person, have been silenced, silenced for so long that it's a gem almost to bring these stories to the forefront. And I think that one of my response, that's why I said sometimes the story finds you, and when it does, you have a responsibility. So I think that's one of my joys is to bring um, these gems and let people see who they really are, who they were, who they have been. And in one of my pieces, to understand that the people who went before you just made the foundation so mm. that you could be here and stand on their successes or even their failures, because they wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. So, you know, that's what I think is 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 important to me. Rochelle, you have the last word. Um, you know, yeah, I think because of our history, you know, black people have been historically barred from from writing, from from, you know, um, well, from literacy on a whole. Um, and so it is a it is a privilege now, you know, it is it is imperative, I would say, that we do tell our stories, you know, because these days, you know, lots of things are being questioned, like who, who gets to be the canon? Um, and I think I think it's important that us as writers, as Jenny said, like it, you know, why wouldn't that be your goal? Like, why wouldn't that be your goal to um amplify other voices, voices that you wish that you had read, um, especially for me, you know, um, I don't know, I, I, I think that growing up where I grew up, um, it, it did sort of feel like, you know, writing as a career wasn't, you know, wasn't really for me. Um, that was for, that was for someone else. And so I very much want to dispel that notion. Um, yeah, mm. writing for us. There is a, a segment of the population here in the United States uh, in the dominant cast who can explore their history with the Google search and see themselves reflected and find their families and see their histories and traditions um, 
on record. And then there's somebody like me, there's somebody like Jenny, there's somebody like Rochelle, somebody like Anne, who have way more obstacles to uncover seeing ourselves in history, seeing ourselves in story, seeing ourselves reflected. And what I am grateful for is that for generations to come, somebody's great grandchild is gonna be able to type in a Google search engine and see themselves because of the three of you. Thank you all oh, so much. Sweet. Thank you. For joining us today. Uh, Thank you. This was fascinating. <laughs> wow. Fascinating. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed your time with us. To all of our guests, we thank you. Um, and as you leave today, we hope that you're feeling more connected uh, to these, these talented artists. Please continue to remain in connection with them. You're invited to stay in touch with them and Jenny and Rochelle. Please refer to the contact information being dropped in the chat as we speak for uh, more information how uh, you all can remain connected to these amazing people. If you'd like to rewatch or share this program, it will be posted on the Kresge Arts in Detroit Presents Art within a few days. We also hope that you'll join us again for the next installment in this series on Thursday, April 21st at noon featuring artist uh, Peter Daniel Bernal, uh, Gisela McDaniel, and Niha Vindapithic. You can learn more and register for the salon using the link in the chat. We thank you again for making time for today's salon and for creating such a meaningful, a beautiful space to be in. Until next time, everybody, we'll see you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you.